Welcome along and welcome to the fifth of these videos called In Search of the Northern Lights. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be thinking about some of the applications of this work, some of the applications of space weather, and then next time we'll go on to talk about what it's like to be working in the Arctic. So what I'm just going to do is I'm going to do a quick screen share, I'm going to pick up the PowerPoint that we're having a little look at today. So We've been talking about the Northern Lights. We've been talking about these lovely bands of green and red and purple in the night sky. We've been talking about what causes them. We've been talking about what gives them these distinctive colours, why these colours arise. We've been talking about how variable they are over time and why we see the Northern Lights in different locations, in different historical eras. But of course, what we're going to be going on to talk about today is about space weather and about some of the practical applications of it or how it affects technological systems. Why do people like engineers, for example, concern themselves with space weather? Okay, so we were talking about this historical overview last time, and then we moved on to say that it had been seen that variations in the magnetic field measured at the surface of the Earth were associated with northern lights, and that variations in the magnetic field led to the predictions of the northern lights. Why? Well, at the end of last time, I was getting you to have a little look at this. So, say the magnitude of a force that a magnetic field, we'll call it B, exerts on a charged particle, we'll call it Q, is given by F, the force, equals Q, the charge, multiplied by V, the velocity of the particle, and then a cross product with B, the magnetic field strength. So, this means there's a force. This force acts at right angles to both the direction of motion of a charged particle and the magnetic fields. Uh, and the magnetic field. So, as we saw last time, we would get charged particles like this iron spiraling around this magnetic field line that's coming out of the board here. And we can work out the gyro radius, the radius of curvature, uh, also known as the Lamour radius. So at the end of last time, I set you this question that seems quite abstract. Suppose we've got a magnetic field now, which is variable in strength. You can see it's stronger here than it is here because we've got more magnetic field lines drawn here than here. So we can see it's got variable strength. We could put in an iron, imagine this iron is spiraling around the magnetic field line. Well, what's it gonna do? Is it just gonna keep doing that nice and happily? No, it's not. We're gonna have the radius of curvature is gonna change. When we're in a region of greater magnetic field strength, the radius of curvature is gonna be smaller. When we're in a region of weaker magnetic field strength, the radius of curvature is gonna be greater. And so our iron moves in this case, it spirals and it moves to the left. What about our electron? Well, our electron does a similar thing. It starts off moving in the opposite direction because it's got an opposite charge. But again, it's subject to the same phenomena here. We've got a larger radius of curvature when we're in a region of weaker magnetic field strength. And so our electron spirals as well. And the electron here is moving to the right. So have a look at this. We've got our electrons moving to the right, ions moving to the left. So we've got a separation of charge. This separation of charge is a current. This is called gradient B drift. The electrons and the ions move in opposite directions. This current is flowing along really nicely here. And as we know, if we've got a current flowing, then you get a magnetic field associated with that current. So we'll have perturbations for magnetic field based on this current. So what would happen to ions and electrons as they approach the Earth? Now here I've drawn the Sun, we've got the Earth, and we're looking from above the North Pole. So this little diagram here is just telling us that North is sort of out of the screen towards us. Now let's suppose we've got ions and electrons approaching the Earth from the night side. It might seem a bit strange at the moment, but we'll come to why we're looking at the night side in a moment. So here's the Sun, here's the Earth, we've got ions and electrons approaching the Earth. Now, the Earth's magnetic field strength is going to get stronger as we get towards the surface. If we think about, say, taking a cross section through the Earth at the equator, then we've got all these magnetic field lines going northwards, and they're stronger nearer the surface of the Earth. So suddenly we've got this region of varying magnetic field strength. Here comes that same formula again, F equals QV cross B, about the force that our charged particles will exhibit. Now, just like in the previous diagram, how we're going to have ions and electrons going in different directions, that's what we get here. Our ions and electrons go in different directions. And this leads to a phenomenon known as the ring current. We get a current like this. We get a current known as the ring current. And we can detect this down at ground level. 
And so we see disturbances to the Earth's magnetic field as a result of this current. Now, why do we care about this? Well, let's go back to this video we looked at in the first session. Here we've got the sun, we've got the solar wind flowing out from the sun into interplanetary space. It's a little bit tenuous, but you can still just about see it there on the screen. Now, here comes the Earth with its magnetic field. The magnetic field of the Earth deflects most of the material coming in from the solar wind, but the shielding's not complete. Some of this material gets trapped, it hurtles in towards the upper atmosphere, and then it crashes into the upper atmosphere of two phenomena going on, ionization and excitation. The process of excitation leads to the northern lights. Ionization, of course, leads to a plasma, and we'll talk more about that in a few moments' time. So we've got this lovely diagram showing this beautifully. The sun, the solar wind, the Earth's magnetic field, some of this material becoming trapped. But just look how elongated the Earth's magnetic field becomes down here. And if we look at this diagram, we can see this in more detail. Here again, we've got the Earth, we've got the sun somewhere over to the left of the image, and we've got the solar wind flowing from left to right. Now, the interplanetary magnetic field, that's the magnetic field carried by the solar wind, can take any orientation at all. And here it is drawn southwards with respect to the Earth. Any orientation, but here we're just going to use this southwards example. Now, all these magnetic field lines represent the solar wind at different times. So it's here, then here, then here, then here, then here, then here. And look, something really interesting happens as it goes past the Earth. Look here. The Earth's magnetic field and the magnetic field of the solar wind are anti-parallel. And so the Earth acts as an obstacle to the solar wind. And so you can think of it like, a, like the parapet of a bridge in a stream as an obstacle to the water, that the Earth and its magnetic field is an obstacle to the solar wind. And eventually what's going to happen is we've got the magnetic field. It's almost like it's piling up here. And we find these anti-parallel magnetic field lines going into a smaller and smaller region until we think of it as being infinitely small. And then they emerge from that region in a different orientation. That different orientation suddenly means we've got this situation here, where we've got the, this magnetic field line connected to the Earth at one end and the solar wind at the other end. And so on here and here and here and here and here. But not here, actually, because then at some point, We've got these magnetic field lines of the Earth pulled out so far from a planet that the, it becomes more energy, uh, it becomes a lower energy state. This whole process of reconnection to happen again. And so we end up with this field line just attached to the solar wind, this one just attached to the Earth. And you can see here it's snapping back like an elastic band. And as it does, it moves plasma with it. So suddenly we've got plasma, these charged particles heading in towards the Earth, heading in towards a region of greater magnetic field strength, and these will form the ring current. We have others, which are along a field line like this that spiral in, and then cause things like the Northern Lights, and cause a plasma at high latitudes. We've got a whole wealth of space weather phenomena going in here, on here. But the point is, some of them we can detect down at the Earth. We can detect things like the Northern Lights because we can see them. We can detect the ring currents because we can detect the perturbations to the Earth's magnetic field as a result. Now, we said when we've got material hurtling in from space, it can do two things. It can cause ionization and excitation. Excitation creates the Northern Lights. Ionization creates a plasma. But that's not the main source of plasma in the Earth's atmosphere. The main source is photoionization. High above the cloud decks, it's always sunny in the daytime. And so in the daytime, we get plasma production by photoionization. The sunlight ionizes the Earth's upper atmosphere, giving us nice even layers like this. Particle precipitation, that material hurtling in from space, the same process that gives us the northern lights, can give us little regions of plasma like this. And these can move around. They move around due to the interaction of the Earth's magnetic field with the magnetic field carried by the solar wind. And if we've got a nice even layer of plasma like this, well, the sun's variable, the solar wind's variable, the whole interaction process is variable. And this nice even layer of plasma, as it moves around, can form structures like this. And these uh, are called polar cap patches. So let's have a look at this. Well, how does this happen? Here we've got the solar wind. You can imagine particles spiraling around these magnetic field lines. And as these magnetic field lines, as their footprints move from here to here to here, 
it's going to take this plasma with it. And this plasma can become structured. The sun is variable in space and in time. The solar wind is variable in space and in time. This whole space weather process is variable in space and in time. And so we get these structures. And what can these structures do? Well, these structures can disrupt trans-ionospheric radio signals. That's a posh word for stuff like GPS. So here we've got our satellites doing something like GPS. We're down here at ground level, and plasma structures in the way can disrupt this signal. It can cause inaccuracies in GPS of about a meter. You might think, well, why do we care about that? I'm trying to find the center of town. I'm a meter out. doesn't matter. I go, oh, look, there it is. And for those sort of applications you write, it doesn't matter. But for things like precise civil engineering, building bridges, building tunnels, it matters. Drilling for oil, it matters. There's also a timing signal associated with GPS. And that timing signal is used by things like the utility networks to uh, coordinate, uh, to coordinate, say, electricity transmission. It's used by things like broadcasters to coordinate their signals as well. And so it's a really important signal. These are not the only space weather effects. Let's have a little look at this movie. We've seen this before, but we're going to see this again. This is a coronagraph. We're looking here at the sun, but we're blocking out the sun with this disc here. And this little circle shows us the position of the centre of the sun. And we can see the solar wind flowing out into interplanetary space. Now, some of these structures are bigger. They're denser. And the denser structures might say compress the Earth's magnetic field and cause space weather phenomena. Sometimes you see these white dots like these, these particles charging off into space at an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. These can damage sensitive instruments on spacecraft. We can get a phenomenon called spacecraft charging, where you can end up with different bits of a spacecraft being at different potential differences. I mean, a current flows to even those out, and that suddenly this extra current can be very bad news for your spacecraft. In terms of the hardware on the spacecraft, ones can become zeros, zeros can become ones. That's bad news. And these space weather phenomena can damage things like the solar panels that keep many spacecraft running. So high energy particles can damage sensitive equipment on spacecraft. What else can happen? We can have strong magnetic fields. We've said we can detect the ring current down at the surface of the Earth. We get a whole bunch of other magnetic effects going on, other currents flowing up in the upper atmosphere, which can cause magnetic effects down at ground level. These can damage power lines and transformers. How? Well, here, for example, we've got lightning. When we've got lightning, what we've got is we've got a difference in charge between the base of the clouds and ground level, and a current flows to even that out. Well, some of the space weather phenomena, what they can do is they can induce a difference in the potential difference at ground level between two different points. Now, in the past, that's not a problem. We have something called a geomagnetically induced current that flows to even out this distribution of charge. Things like rock and soil and stuff are not terribly good conductors. So this happens slowly. The current is small, you wouldn't really notice it. We've kindly built high voltage power lines all over the country that help nature out. So a current can flow from ground into these power lines, through the power lines and back to ground at the other end. These power lines are really good at conducting electricity. So this process can happen quickly and the current can be very large. This can damage power lines, it can damage transformers. And there was a famous event in Quebec in 1989 where a series of space weather events took out the national grid of Quebec. Some of these things can shorten the lifetimes of transformers, so it's something we want to understand much better. And of course, when we're talking about magnetic fields, well, it can do all sorts of other things as well. The earliest reported instance of a space weather effect on a technological system was in the days of the Great Western Railway about 150 years ago. The evening train was waiting to leave Exeter to go down to the South Devon coast and the telegraph system they used at the time to see whether the lines were clear or not went haywire. So I thought well the train can't go it needs to wait. 20 minutes later the telegraph system was fine and so the train set off heading down towards the South Devon coast. So you might think well 20 minutes who cares about that it's not a big deal and it wasn't. But Eisenbach Kingdom Brunel 
the guy behind the, uh, many of the technological and engineering achievements of the Great Western Railway. He did not like a mystery. He started looking into this. And there's a magnetic disturbance seen at an observatory at Kew on the outskirts of London in the Earth's magnetic field at the time. And that was attributed to space weather. And that magnetic disturbance was what was thought to have caused this telegraph system to go haywire. So it was thought that that was the first recorded instance of a sort of space weather phenomena damaging a technological system. And of course, in the intervening 150 years, our technological systems have become more and more and more advanced. So let's go back to this example here. You can think about how space weather can disrupt communication because of its effect on something like GPS. Now, GPS is the American system for something called GNSS, Global Navigational Satellite Systems, which includes the American GPS system, the European system Galileo, and a whole bunch of other systems around the world. Do you think how reliant we are on these? And if you'd like to read a bit more about this, I would encourage you to do so. There's a wonderful applications report. If you Google Royal Academy of Engineering Space Weather, a very detailed report will come up. What I'd like you to do between now and the next session is read the introduction to that and then choose a particular area you find particularly interesting and read through that to see the applications of this work and to see what the space weather phenomena might do and how we can mitigate against those. Then what we're going to do next time is we're going to talk about working in the high Arctic, about, uh, about, some of the, about what it's like to be up there as a researcher looking at space weather phenomena. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. The next video will be posted on Thursday and I hope very much to speak to you then. Thank you.